Well, welcome back. We're talking about the latest in space exploration. Joining us from Los Angeles is one of NASA's chief innovators and mission specialists, Rob Manning. With us here in Washington is Dr. Valerie Neal. She's a historian and curator at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Valerie, recently we had the Mars rover landing. We had the Orion launch. That was a vehicle that was launched to space that came back. We had a spacecraft put on uh, a comet. Uh, these are all spectacular developments in space exploration. So where are we now in terms of exploring space? Well, I think from the human space flight side, we're almost at a pivot point. Uh, with the launch of Orion, our first step toward having a crew vehicle that's capable of leaving Earth orbit, it will be a few more years before that's really ready for flight yet. But that's the pivot point ahead, I see. We have 15 years on the International Space Station, uh, learning what we need to know about sending people on really long duration missions. So for human space flight, I think we're almost at a pivot point. In robotic space flight, out exploring the solar system, I think we're in um, almost a golden age. There is so much going on with spacecraft at all the planets virtually uh, that we're just learning more every single day. And it's like we're coming into this full flowering of planetary exploration. Right, those robotic vehicles that you talk about, uh, that's what our other guest does for a living, Rob Manning, right. who is at the Jet Propulsion Center. Rob, when we think of you know, early space exploration, we think of technology of the 20th century, you know, things like rockets, computers, jet propulsion. Um, how is the technology now evolving in the 21st century? Well, in many respects, it's the same technology. We've always had to use r rockets to get us anywhere. We've always needed to have uh, computers and uh, motors and software. What's changing is, that the, is the level of integration. We can put things together, just like your cell phone. Think about all those apps, all those different ways your phone does things for you, and you don't even think about it anymore. But you think about the technology that goes into integrating all that into one little device. That's exactly the kind of technological pathway we're on right now, where our systems are getting more and more integrated and coupled and allowing for capabilities that in years past we would only dream about. So uh, now, now still, I, there's a long way to go. Our rovers, the technology that we flew, uh, the, the, for example, the, the computer technology that we flew on a Curiosity rover is not brand new technology. Some, some of this stuff is very old, partly because it has to be uh, uh, made so that s it can survive the radiation environment of space. But even so, we're figuring out ways to put more and more stuff in a smaller, smaller, smaller package. And some of the capabilities that we can envision are really astounding. So, Valerie, we have, um, you know, people focusing on different aspects of exploring space. Uh, one is, you know, putting these robotic vehicles on other planets. We have deep space exploration. We have the Voyager 2, which is now outside our solar system. Uh, and then, of course, we have people who are trying to get commercial vehicles into space as well. Where are scientists focusing their attention right now? Well, I think scientists are focusing their attention on the planetary side in understanding more about what those worlds are like out there in the solar system and what they have to tell us about the world we inhabit and the history and origins of the formation of the solar system. Also, which bodies out there in the solar system might be um, amenable to a human presence as explorers. On the um, life sciences side of exploration, I think the scientists are really trying to understand very, very well what happens to the human body during long duration space flight, uh, what changes happen in the uh, internal systems. Our whole body is affected by microgravity. What kind of radiation exposure are people going to be exposed to for long duration space flight or long uh, stays on Mars? How can we protect the human being better uh, for surviving that kind of long-term space exploration? And that's the kind of work that's going on in the International Space Station right now. Right. Rob, when we look at something like Curiosity, is this essentially a robotic vehicle that's doing the testing for something that Valerie talks about, putting a man or a woman on Mars? Well, it's got many, many jobs. One of the, but one of the key jobs, as Valerie said, was, is, to, is to find out whether or not Mars is a safe place for humans to go. 
One of the experiments on board, for example, is measuring the radiation environment that a human being would experience over the life of the mission. I mean, if you think about it, uh, uh, Curiosity, in its eight-month voyage to Mars, uh, experienced the radiation of deep space. Um, so we, had, we were able to monitor that radiation on board the vehicle, just as if it were a human being. And even today on the surface, we're continuing recording that information to allow us to assess what it would mean for human beings. And it's turning out that Mars, although it, it, it can be dangerous, we think it's possible to protect people and, I, and, and make this uh, a, a very p a practical uh, matter of actually sending real people to Mars safely without a lot of without excessive concern about the radiation. Even though it's not trivial, I don't want to make it, uh, uh, make it d diminish it too much, but it's not as bad as we thought. But there was a time when space exploration was confined basically to two countries, really. It was the United States, and then, of course, there was the Soviet Union, which subsequently became a whole bunch of republics, but, you know, Russia is still involved in space exploration. But now we're having a lot of other countries involved. European countries are involved. Um, India, China is involved in this as well. How global has this become? No, I, I think as countries uh, build strong economies and they build the knowledge base, um, to be able to pursue the engineering and uh, the human factors of going into space, it's almost inevitable that they're going to want to venture out into space. And my personal opinion is the more countries that are involved, the better, uh, because that will just accelerate pushing the frontiers of knowledge. Um, and it's increasingly expensive, and it's harder for a single nation to bear the full cost uh, of doing everything that beckons us to do. Uh, so I think it's great that other countries are getting involved. All right, Rob, you wanted to say. Yes, absolutely. We, we, we've now been working very closely with the Indian Space Agency to, 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 exp to further our understanding. The, the, the Indians have put a vehicle uh, in orbit around Mars just recently, um, and, it's, and uh, uh, they are just going in leaps and bounds to figure out how they can do this effectively. And they've done it incredibly uh, inexpensively and very efficiently. And, you know, they should be very proud of their accomplishments. This, to me, this is not just, not just India, but all over the world, people are wanting to get involved. And what's so great is that some of the technologies that we now have, that commercial technologies have developed, are amenable to going to outer space and, 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 and at, at, at reasonable costs. It's not as expensive as it used to be, and, and a lot of countries are joining in, and I really, it's really exciting because it's made for, uh, you know, for all, all this information we get from all these vehicles are shared globally, and it adds to our under, global understanding uh, world, uh, of our solar system and beyond. It's very exciting. Something very else exciting that's... Time. Yes, Rob, something else that's very exciting is uh, we've just been able to map... Uh, one of the moons of Jupiter, Europa, and there is a possibility, we're being told right now, that there could be some life form, extraterrestrial life form, on this moon. Uh, how will we get there, and how will we find this? Well, we've got a project uh, called Europa Clipper. It's a project that we, we will, uh, where we hope to go to put it, a vehicle in orbit around Europa. Now, Europa... Uh, the environment around Europa is very dangerous for human beings and for spacecraft, so we have to be very careful because the radiation field that Jupiter creates is very, very strong. But the interesting thing about Europa, Europa is this amazing, it's a fairly small moon of Jupiter, yet it's completely covered in a thick shell of ice. And, and below the ice, we are convinced, is a vast, vast ocean, many, many times larger than our own oceans on this planet. And we could see cracks forming on this ice where we believe their organic uh, molecules are leaking out of these cracks. And, and so from orbit, we might be able to spy on that uh, organic residue to determine whether or not it's, it has uh, geologic origins or perhaps biological origins. Because inside that ice, on, in those oceans, could be a whole environment where life is possible. Right, Valerie, you talked about other countries being involved in space exploration. Where does China fit into this? China's coming on strong, I think. Um, certainly wanting to not just put up satellites and um, automated spacecraft, but but to have an astronaut corps to send people into space to aim to the moon, and I would assume to aim to Mars as well, if not beyond. There's a sort of natural pathway 
uh, in leaving Earth orbit. And the moon beckons and Mars beckons also. Okay, we have a few seconds left. I have a final question for you, Valerie, and that is, uh, we're looking at a lot of commercial companies, uh, looking at space tourism. How far are we away from that becoming a viable business venture? Uh, for suborbital space tourism, um, we're not very far away. Um, the setback with the Virgin Galactic right. um, crash, of course, um, has slowed the pace somewhat, but um, I think that suborbital space flight is attainable and is probably a viable business. Orbital space flight or beyond orbit, I think, are still a long time away. Uh, that's much harder. Valerie Neal, Rob Manning, thanks to both of you for joining us. And that's all we have time for, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show or chat with us on Twitter at CCTV underscore America. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.